I'm Rex Buchanan, and uh, today is January 18th, 2021. I'm at my home in Lawrence, Kansas, and I'll be interviewing Dave Heineman, who is uh, at his home in Topeka. Uh, Dave is a former legislator, and I want to start, Dave, with uh, uh, a question about uh, just your background. Uh, you're in my mind, and I probably in a lot of folks' mind, really associated with Garden City, which you represented for years and years in the legislature. Are you native of Garden? Is that where you come from originally? Well, actually, uh, Northeast Nebraska, I was born at West Point. Sounds better if you don't mention the state. Uh, but uh, grew up on a farm there. And in the eighth grade, I moved to a small farm outside Garden City, just directly uh, east of the Brookover feed yard. And in a way, uh, my upbringing uh, probably put me in a good position as far as understanding all the water issues or from my perspective, particularly when I entered the legislature. Uh, in Nebraska, we raised corn on the farm, no irrigation. I didn't even know what a pump was. Then we moved to Garden City, a small farm outside of town. It had a irrigation well. It got free natural gas uh, because of the pressure of the Huguenin field at that time. Uh, we did flood irrigation from one of the ditches. I'd never experienced that before to actually see some fish coming down while we were irrigating. But uh, as a kid there, it, it started uh, giving me a perspective. And then later when I worked my way through college, uh, one of the joining neighbor was a gentleman who uh, was a area manager for Carson Thomas Pioneer Seed. So I would spend the summer traveling about 20,000 miles all over Southwest Kansas, parts of Oklahoma, parts of Colorado, uh, hauling seed between dealers. And in that process, got to really see and experience how irrigation took off at that time. And the time frame is probably where things were speeding up quite a bit because uh, this was in 1963 is when I started doing my running around Southwest Kansas. And at that time, uh, we didn't have any uh, sprinkler irrigation. In fact, uh, Don Williams, the gentleman I worked for, I didn't realize until years later, he used to live at Halstead and he was the plaintiff in the Williams versus city of Wichita, which turned out being the seminal case in Kansas on the Water Appropriations Act that uh, was enacted uh, by the legislature in 1945, the, the month I was born uh, in July. So I, I had that perspective and I'll never forget uh, one summer, I think it was 64, he said, Dave, get in the car with me, I got something to show you. And so we went south of Garden City and through the Sand Hills and about 10 miles and went to a farm, Clarence Jiggett, uh, he was an old senior farmer there, and uh, turned off right immediately south of his homestead and there was a huge field of corn in the, growing in the middle of sand. And what he had there was his experiment on the first center pivot sprinkler in Southwest Kansas. And it was ironic that uh, almost 50 years to the day, I was on a geological survey field conference and we were at a field about six miles west of there, watching the dragon system, the, 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 or however you pronounce it, the new system, and it, is, it just showed how uh, irrigation, the use of it, has changed dramatically through all of these years out in Western Kansas. Uh, so it, it really helped me because I was never intending to, to end up in the legislature or KCC working with issues there. Uh, so my experience, long story you got out of this, but basically uh, growing up on the farm there, a small one did, give me a background to help understand and work with the folks around Southwest Kansas. So let's go back a little bit. Why did your family move from Nebraska to South, why Southwestern Kansas? Well, my uncle uh, had a business there and he said, if you come down here, we've got a farm, we could, we could uh, work together in a partnership. Uh, uh, in Nebraska, my dad's father passed away when he was seven and uh, we rented land, moved around on it, and I think he saw this as an opportunity, uh, which didn't pan out, unfortunately, uh, but uh, that's how it worked. And when, when you said on that farm, you 
were involved with flood irrigation. Was that yes. based on ditch irrigation out of the out of the yeah, article? It was, it was ditch irrigation. I learned how to hate Johnson grass, uh, and uh, we would have the manager, uh, Mr. Mang, and he'd show up and say, "Okay, you got a thirty-six hour run. Get ready for it." And uh, we had the the ditches. Uh, uh, we get the ditch water and we did flood irrigation and you know in hindsight that's probably the a very wasteful way to irrigate because you got to push the water all the way through from one side to the other actually i remember we had a horse that we only used when we were flood irrigating because in the middle of the night you could trot that horse out there and when it was slosh 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 you knew where the water was <laughs> So did you move around gated pipe and all that stuff that I hear stories about? No, we didn't have a gated pipe. My, my fond recollection of gated pipe is to seeing a bunch of it twisted around a telephone pole when we, by the experiment station, we had that tornado way back when. We had the irrigation tubes. That's what okay. we did. All right, siphon tubes. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we did the si si siphon tubes. And, and, but, and that's the same thing we did with our irrigation well. It was also by ditch and, and pumping it that way. So I, I was very intrigued the first time I saw that setter pivot. I'd never seen one before in my life. And ironically, the, the Jiggett family, his son, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, formed a business uh, selling those sprinklers. Uh, and his family was very much into it. Uh, at one point, it was said that they had uh, in the family operation about 300 center pivots. And it was also something that uh, really developed the land around, uh, in the Sand Hills in particular, land that went for $30 an acre. Uh, you didn't see that price anymore because you could put a center pivot on it and grow corn. Uh, and it was also the start, too, of, of the feedlot industry in western Kansas. Uh, Earl Brookover was an amazing individual. Uh, he had the first commercial feedlot, but he was did the first of about everything. And it wasn't uh, until his memorial service when they were talking about him, they recounted how he actually drilled the first irrigation wells in Scott County. He, uh, as a kid or something, been in South America someplace and saw irrigation, went to K-State to learn everything he could about it, and then proceeded to go that way and actually built sort of a, uh, a, a great, uh, agricultural industry of his own in, in Western Kansas based on irrigation. And uh, growing up in, in uh, <clears throat> Nebraska, Cumming County, uh, they used to have a, a lot of feedlots and they were known at one time as the beef capital of the world. And I got to watch how it moved to Southwest Kansas uh, with feedlots everywhere uh, and corn. And with it, we had all the other problems with uh, transportation, highways. That's why as a legislator, I was very much interested in trying to get the highway plan big enough so it would come out. Highway 83 was notorious for the truck traffic because even today, Southwest Kansas cannot raise all the grain it needs. There is a tremendous amount of truck traffic heading into Southwest Kansas. And so irrigation really, uh, the way it happened was an economic boost to Southwest Kansas because uh, the communities there were not decreasing in population like they were in the rest of rural Kansas at that time. Uh, if you had feedlots, you had to have workers. If you had uh, equipment, you had all of these other things that sort of were spun off, fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to make the operations work. And the population of Garden City uh, my district as a state representative uh, one time was basically almost all the county. And by the time I left, uh, there were three representatives covering parts of it. And my district was shrunk to a very small size, basically of the north part of Garden City. Uh, went to something a little over 10,000 people to 25,000 or more uh, through the those 30, 40 year time frame because of, of how things grew. And it had to do with, I believe, the economics of irrigation. And of course, being on the oil oil aquifer, uh, I got to see too how that uh, was drawn down. Uh, the farm we moved to originally, the, we had a well there, of course, we took it out of the Olivian from the Arkansas River. And you could go down 10, 15 feet and you'd have water. And a few years uh, later, when we left, uh, you had to go down 90 to 100 feet to find water. Uh, you know, it was sort of a, 
learning firsthand just how uh, pumping and uh, water causes problems. Let's and and uh, so clearly you are uh, in a part of the world where irrigation really takes off and has an incredible impact, uh, and you are in that part of the world at the time when that has really taken place. You, let's let's back up a little bit. You go to where? Where, where did you go to school and what did you study? In college. Well, I went, actually, I've got my Augustana University shirt on since you asked the question. It used to be Augustana College. It was a small Lutheran college up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, of all places. But we won't go to the stories of how we got there. That's where I did my four years. Uh, and 67 is when I graduated. I then went to the University of Kansas. Uh, political science, I was I double majored German uh, in political science in college. And I was actually looking and in, going into the Foreign Service. Uh, but if you will recall, in 67, uh, 68, uh, in 68, uh, the Vietnam War, everything that was going on, Bobby Kennedy came to the University of Kansas campus. I remember going to see him in Allen Fieldhouse. Uh, later, he was assassinated. Uh, we also have Martin Luther King, whose birthday is actually today. And later, he was assassinated that year. And uh, I have a, a close friend, Jim Kincannon, who is now former dean of the Washburn Law School. And uh, we concocted a plan how a young kid could go out, you know, 22, and, and actually knock doors and, and run for political office because there was a house seat open. And that sort of started my political career. It, it sure was a foreign service as far as going into the Kansas legislature. Uh, so a a after you... After you completed law school, then did you go back out and practice in, in garden or did you? Yeah, well, I was not a lawyer when I went to the legislature. Uh, that came later. Uh, once I got there, uh, all the old timers kept saying, hey, if I, mean, if I was young and single like you, I'd go to law school. And so I went to law school and then later, uh, of course, set up my practice in Garden City in 73, uh, right across from the courthouse. Had to do it as a solo practice because if I wanted to stay in the legislature, none of the firms in town would want me in their practice. So you went, you went basically from being an undergraduate back out there to run for the legislature. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> How, so, so you're 22 when you're elected to the legislature? Well, actually 23 by then, but 22 when I filed. Uh, and you had to be 21 to run back then. I made the mistake once of voting for the 18 year old vote pushing that and had a 19 year old run against me when I was 28 to get the old guy out. And you had to be by far one of the youngest, the youngest person in the legislature at that point. But let's, let's talk a little bit about, so, so you campaign, it's the, it's Finney County, the entire county at that point in effect? Pretty much all the county. Uh, the Garfield Township uh, was not part of it. And uh, yeah, and, and the key thing was knocking every door. And uh, it, it was ironic in later years, Sonny Rendell, former State Board of Education member reminded me, and I hadn't, that I, I hit the county too. I actually pulled him off a tractor to ask for his vote. And he never forgot that. And was there any particular issue at that point or was this more uh, a seat came open that, that you thought it was timely to run for? Well, I think yeah, it, it's hard to say. Uh, the seat came open and uh, there was a former, uh, well, the school board president uh, uh, was running for office as a Democrat. George Meeker, the former Republican or, who held it, was running for Congress. Uh, and uh, Jim and I thought, well, no, if nobody else has filed. Uh, uh, someone on get a seat just for filing. And so I went to the Secretary of State's office, basically the an hour before the filing deadline and asked, is anybody else filed from Garden City yet? And they said, no. So it was a $10 filing fee and I had 10 bucks on me. So about 15 minutes before uh, the deadline I filed and uh, called Jim out there the next morning and he said, oh, by the way, the party sent up somebody so you have a primary. And I hadn't even bothered to talk to the Republican counties people before I did that. So that was 
a very, very low day because I had also not told my parents I was doing this. <laughs> I'll not to start it out right. But it was a matter of, of uh, doing the door knocking. And, and that was a good process because it, people is how everything should work. I think in, uh, you know, sitting in the catbird seat behind the camera and the other interviews you've done, I, I, I've got the sense that the people who have been most successful are those who have learned the communication skills. Uh, for instance, uh, you, Dave Pope, uh, when he was dealing with the Cheyenne Bottoms problem uh, and how they were going to control the competing interest, I think his ability to work through that uh, had a lot to do with how he knew how to work with people. And I had also got to know Dave when he was uh, GMD director of uh, or hit out at Garden City. That's where I first got to know him, and which actually helped later when he became he took Guy Gibson's place uh, as chief engineer. But uh, and we often joke about how Dave will give you a long answer. Don't uh, don't ask an extra question. But he had an ability, I think, to understand and try and work with people. And that's what I've also noticed through the whole legislative process or wherever I've been. It's how you are able to communicate. Uh, and and I'm jumping ahead to here a little bit, but when I was later general counsel in 95 or six at the KCC, uh, I was told, well, you show up the legislature, people aren't too happy with you. And, and in particular, the irrigators out in Southwest Kansas are very, very unhappy with the KCC. And so I started communicating. Uh, we had a court case in Pugeton. And so I flew out there with the, uh, the legal staff. And as I was in the courthouse, I said, well, who, who's, who's on the other side? Where are they? And said, is there any ethical legal problem if I go try and talk to them? And they said, no. So I started conversations with them. Uh, these were irrigators. And uh, in the conversations, since I'd actually been out in that area working my way through college, I knew a lot of their friends. And so we started communicating. And we got to the point that when the gas pressures in the Huguenin field dropped significantly, such that their irrigation pumps would not run, they were in trouble. And I remember one weekend, I got several calls from them. They want to come visit with us, but want to come visit with me. And I said, well, if you can show up Monday, I don't know who I can have as staff. But I was fortunate to get the right people. And we spent all morning visiting with these irrigators and trying to figure out options, alternatives. Uh, you know, you did, they didn't have the free gas or, or cheaper gas to use anymore. They needed a, an energy source. And there were options to look at. They could even set up their own utility. But it was through the process. And they started looking at the KCC as a friend trying to help them. And I think that has a, a great deal to how you work with people. That's the same in the legislative process. Uh, one of the things that I've been struck also that you've touched on already as we've gone through these interviews is that people very often uh, credit their involvement to a mentor or somebody who was there at the very beginning. And you've already mentioned Concanon. Is it Don, Don Concanon? No, it's not Don. Don, Don was another, he ran, Don Concanon ran, ran for governor. Jim Kincannon uh, was a close friend of mine at Garden City High School, and I was actually, we roomed together at KU. He was doing his senior year, and I was doing my grad school work. Uh, and later on, uh, Jim got his law degree, which is another story, of, uh, and came over and actually clerked for Justice Frowney. And I remember talking to Dean Rice Bing one night uh, after class, and he was looking for someone to teach conflicts. So... I said, I got this guy, he was first in his class at KU Law School, uh, here's his phone number, and sight unseen, he hired him, and uh, Jim ended up teaching almost 50 years, but for the COVID this year, he probably would have been teaching, but he served as dean for 13 years, which is okay. uh, outstanding. Yeah, he, he, he's been a great mentor, a great friend, uh, but for him, I, I would not have been elected, but I, he had a list of everybody, uh, what, when I knocked doors, so I, I would know more about them probably than they wanted me to when I started the conversation. So when you go to the legislature, do you wind up on water-related committees right out of the chute? No. Uh, actually, uh, tax committee, local government, reapportionment were my first committees. 
And then uh, when the lawyers started leaving, actually be, since I was in law school, I, I became the first lay member of the Judiciary Committee. My, and then I also got on the Appropriations Committee. And of course, if you deal with budgets, you deal with everything, with water, what have you. My first uh, really working with water came when Mike Hayden became speaker and appointed me as chair of the House Energy and Natural Resources Committee. I'd never been on the committee. And that was a surprise. Uh, and I don't know the specific reasons why, but uh, we worked very closely together in the House Appropriation or Ways and Means Committee. That's what it's called back then. And uh, he probably knew of my, you know, my Western Kansas roots and probably knew that I understood and cared about water. Uh, he also knew my work in the committee. And probably uh, it was the year before, while he was still chair of the Ways and Means Committee, that uh, I was fortunate uh, one evening to get about $120,000 into the budget on the House bill to, file, to start the lawsuit against Colorado on the Arkansas River issue. Uh, so the 83-84 session was a, a very critical one for the Energy Committee. Uh, we had the Wolf Creek hearings. And uh, I think I was maybe only one other attorney on the committee, but we literally had the Supreme Court room for a whole week on the hearings because with the Wolf, Wolf Creek issue, they, they had the significant rate shock that was appearing. How are you going to handle it? I was lobbied real hard by the utilities because they just wanted, well, we just need to put it in the rate base. Uh, politically, that was not too cool of an idea because uh, we had been under this construction work in progress where you couldn't put anything into rate base until it was actually completed. Uh, and as you well know, the, the nuclear power plant, uh, those costs just skyrocketed. That was one issue. The other one that we were working on too was the water plant. And uh, Charlie Angel, Senator from Mount Plains, Kansas, who I deeply respected, I think was one of the big leaders in this because he had been on the Senate Energy Committee and suddenly we were working together. We actually did interviews, uh, TV networks and stuff like that, promoting the state water plan, its development. John Carlin, who uh, I'd had the privilege of working with and many years in the house and particularly then when he <coughs> was speaker and, and then later as governor. Uh, I mean, we were working together. Uh, this was, in our opinion, this was not a partisan issue. Charlie Angel, uh, you will recall from a prior interview, was very influential in a meeting that Carlin had in his office when he assembled all of the various water type agencies, boards or folks, and made it clear that he wanted them to become involved in planning. And Charlie there to, to this course, stood up and actually uh, said, if, Governor, if they don't start doing this, I'll actually introduce a bill and we'll, we'll get rid of their position earlier. And Charlie was a unique person. He was, as Vice President of the Senate, that's something too that needs to be mentioned. He was in a, a higher position to help do things. Um, Charlie, ironically, a farmer, uh, I think his father or grandfather uh, invented the angel plow, which was a sort of a one way that uh, broke up Southwest Kansas never irrigated. He considered it a precious resource and he was he just wasn't going to get into that and maybe he had some other reasons. Uh, Dave, let's go back to uh, a lot of the uh, water related legislation that we've been talking about, particularly the formation of groundwater management districts and uh, then eventually uh, development of water office, water authority, that sort of thing. But, but a lot of that legislation really gets going in the early, mid, some of the late 70s. But, and, and so you're in the legislature, but you're not on the, the, right, the water related not, not committee. The committee itself. Uh, but of course, it's an issue out. And so I sort of, you know, follow it uh, uh, because we care. And, and I, the point is, the thing that always came up is local control. You go out to Western Kansas, you talk, it's local control. Uh, school finance in 92, uh, after that passed, uh, the, the counties out there were in a secessionist movement. And here's where Don Kincannon, the other Kincannon you're talking about from Hugoton, uh, he and his son were instrumental. I mean, they had a vote in one county out there. 
uh, going to secede, and it was about 1,100 to 90 uh, for secession. So you talk, lo local control means a lot. And that's what I remember being the issue, that they, they always did not like people from Topeka, outside of Washington, telling them what to do. And so I think the GMDs, uh, they came into existence when they were starting to understand, you're mining that water. It's not going to be here forever. And so how are you going to control it? Well, do you want the state to control it or do you want to control it? And I think they saw the GMDs as a better option. Of course, you can get into specifics about how it was set up, who's in charge and who does, does what. But I think they saw that as a way to start to control their own destiny out there because water was being mined. So as, as the legislative process generated that GMD Act and the other than legislation that came along that reflected that concern about local control, were you involved in the development of those, of those, of that legislation? Did you, or did you just watch it and get involved when your constituents asked you to? How, how involved were you in that process? I, I was really not personally involved in it uh, because I was, I, I say that because I was not on a committee that was actually okay. working. And obviously uh, you, every legislator's vote counts and you have conversations with people. And uh, as a person from Southwest Kansas Garden City, I would often have said, well, you're from out there. What do you folks think about this? What, you know, in that way, it's sort of tangential as to how you can help the process. I don't recall any severe um, animosity toward the setting up of GMDs. Uh, you know, tech, usually if, if you're not involved, people tend not to become interested in stuff, but they definitely were interested in Western Kansas and, and trying to, to control their destiny. Uh, I, I'm trying to sort of decide whether to proceed chronologically here or, well, I think one of the things that you really bring of huge value to these conversations, Dave, is that perspective of having grown up and lived and represented Southwestern Kansas for as long as you did. And then you moved to Eastern Kansas eventually, but you still, I think, in the minds of most folks are certainly strongly associated with that Southwestern Kansas part of the world. Oh, yeah. How, uh, how effective did, did that idea of local control work? Let, let's talk about Southwestern Kansas, because I think that's really, it, it is such an area that you, you've touched on already. Uh, it, it is so important because center pivots really explode down there and they go into the sand hills, places that basically generally hadn't been cultivated until center pivots come along. They suddenly grow all this corn, they develop all these monstrously big feedlots, and then they get big packing plants that you don't see anyplace else in Kansas other than in southwestern Kansas. So if you want to talk about water issues and where the heart of the matter is, those counties, Finney is one of them, there are several obviously, but southwestern Kansas is where it's at. So given all that history, did that idea of local control, did it work? Did those GMDs, do you think looking back on it now, did those GMDs, have they delivered what people in that part of the world wanted to deliver? I really can't answer that because I think everybody can look at it and see, see how they would like to answer it. I, if GMDs could have set it up so that we could be at sustainability today, which I think is what people want to look at, that would have been great. But uh, just the nature of it, I, I, it's, that would not have happened instantly. Uh, I, they, they were able to start regulating it. Uh, I remember often the, the debate over, well, metering wells, you know, again, that was a, that's my private right. Uh, you know, we had posse comitatus people out there, but, but hopefully they weren't part of our irrigation community. But uh, again, too, we get into the court cases. Uh, uh, once the GMDs were set up, you know, what authority do they have to regulate and actually try to control the conserve water? Uh, the, there's a key case, F. Arthur Stone. Uh, I kind of looked at that. I never knew art as F. Arthur Stone. But uh, he had gone out uh, without a permit or anything and put down two wells and put two sprinklers up in the sand hills. And uh, then later tried to try to get 
get his permission for it. Well, uh, that was denied. And uh, they went to court on it. And it was uh, reading the case. I basically knew all the parties in it. Uh, plaintiff actually, attorney actually ran against me once for state house. Uh, and it, most interestingly, Justice Hurd, Harold Hurd, who from Coldwater, Kansas, that's where he came from, wrote the opinion, uh, which I found interesting, a, a great opinion. Because, but basically it said that reaffirmed the right of the Water Appropriation Act to control, and they had since put in criminal penalties, and the Supreme Court said, you don't have a right to do that. And I think that that started, you know, the GMDs then had some authority that they could clearly do things. Uh, you get into the policy problem of what did the boards do? Uh, you know, I could argue they should have gone a lot faster doing something, but then how far do you push that if they're trying to do it themselves? Then what's the alternative? Do you have the state come in and tell them they can't do it? Uh, then you've got a political firestorm. Uh, and nowadays, the way the politics have changed, I'm not sure just exactly what you could or couldn't do. Back when I was serving in the 70s, 80s, there was a lot of bipartisanship for it. I mean, water was not necessarily a Republican or Democrat issue. Uh, it's a political issue. It was just how it was observed at home. Probably not a clear answer here, but uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's should have done more. But how bad does it have to get before you can come in with what could be seen as an extreme answer? Right. Well, it's a difficult proposition because on the one hand, people want local control. On the other hand, those GMDs are uh, managed by boards of directors that are elected by landowners in the GMD who have a vested interest very often in continuing behavior that's been economically profitable to them in the past. So to expect them to come in and, and uh, make massive changes in water use, I, I think is... Uh, it, and as, as you look back on it, it, it almost feels like a prescription for failure if those are what yeah, goals so, are. So you get into the question then, how do you put into statute or law a magic formula to put people on? Uh, I know uh, the Equus bed, uh, they had a good mix of municipal irrigator and, and the folks involved in it and uh, with people, uh, as I understand, that uh, really were wanting to address the situation. Uh, you've got the possibility, like you're saying, you've got to maybe be controlled by a certain group that really don't want to do some of those things. Uh, you know, local control. Uh, everybody at the state house is for local control unless they see a local doing something they don't like, uh, which, which is just crazy. But uh, uh, we've seen a lot of that uh, where the legislature passes laws saying you, you, you you can't do things in farmer's markets because it might affect a pizza hut someplace else because they, do, they just don't understand local. And even in the school system, for instance, uh, the state constitution gives every local board of education uh, local autonomy. And during this pandemic, uh, you could see some boards by flat unanimous vote says, we are not gonna mask in our school. And there were a lot of those out around the state. Um, on the other hand, you had other school districts that said, we're going to be very safe. We're going to be closed. It's going to be virtual. Uh, you know, what is local control? It doesn't necessarily always mean what is in the best interest because the perspective of the person making that judgment may be different. Well, and speaking, speaking of different perspectives, the other two Ogallala-based groundwater management districts, or particularly the one in northwestern Kansas, uh, basically have, have taken... Uh, more steps toward conservation, where if you were to ask me today what I associate with the GMD in southwestern Kansas, it's the idea of water importation and an aqueduct. Uh, there is, I mean, there's clearly less of a priority toward conservation and more of a priority toward supply. Politically, southwestern Kansas feels to me like a very different place than northwestern Kansas. Yeah in terms of belief in local control, uh, in, in uh, 
in all sorts of ways. I assume, that, is that a fair characterization, do you think? I, I think it is, sure. And why, uh, why is that? Why well, is Southwestern Kansas so different? I would, <laughs> if I was an expert on that, I could probably write a book, but I think it's the demographics of how Southwest Kansas evolved. It had an unpunishable, a, a big source of water. Uh, it wasn't until years later uh, I learned about how that aquifer out there, while it's being mined, is, is different in so many different ways. But as you well know, uh, the deepest portions are, are, the, are in certain areas of southwest Kansas. Uh, as you go further north, that's where you've probably seen more of the wells shut down because they've, they've effectively used what they could. Uh, and it may have been because the, uh, southwest Kansas uh, for so long was able to do so much pumping because you could keep doing it. I mean, what, what was it? We had a 25 year or, or, or 40 year uh, idea as far as how we were gonna draw it down. Uh, I mean, the plan was to mine it. And I would suppose once you get into that mantra of mining it, uh, you're used to it. And so if you've been using it, you're gonna see the cutbacks in, in a very significant way if you suddenly flip the switch and go to conserving. I think even up in Northwest Kansas, uh, when they were talking about cutting down, you know, the 20%, uh, uh, the Limas are, that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they already were in a situation of where they knew they were in trouble. And so they were willing, more willing to try it. Uh, I recall being uh, on a field conference several years ago and we were in Scott City, I think, or, or close by over, or maybe it was, which, um, Lakin, not like him anyway. And uh, we were in on a meeting of some of the folks out there that were trying to think how they could set up something like that. But politically they had problems. Uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's only when you run out of water, so to speak, when a well runs dry, that you realized you could have more effectively addressed the situation earlier. Uh, and this would be human nature. In some respects, southwestern Kansas, though, has dealt with that issue of declining resources, not only in terms of the Ogallala, but also in terms of the Hugoton natural gas area, uh, which, uh, has, which, seen, which saw significant declines in productivity uh, over time. Uh, it, it, the, the mining economy, while not as visible, because it's all in the subsurface and doesn't, you know, nobody can see it taking place, Southwestern Kansas has is almost a poster child for that boom time mentality based on natural resources that sense of being depleted. Is that a fair summation? Do you think? Uh, I, th I think you could look at it that way. Uh, actually, I recall of where they came in with the infill drilling on on the Hugoton field because they weren't <laughs> extracting it fast enough. I mean, the Southwest Kansas royalty owners are in favor of that. Uh, but you know, a resource that originally was 436 psi in a full Huguenot field is now what the once touted as the largest gas field in the world. It now basically is non-existent, and even the Pomona below it. But uh, uh, and I didn't ever think when I was at the KCC that uh, we'd be looking at documents where they were asking power to actually suck the gas out. Suck, yeah. The pressure wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, did water, in, in all the campaigns that you went through, and you, you would have gone through a, a fair number, uh, did water yeah. come up as an issue in, in that process? It never, it never really did. Uh, no, it, I, I think when you talk about political issues, it usually has to be something that uh, people feel is immediate. Uh, right. Unfortunately, the campaigns we have, okay, what's the hot issue of the day? Is it now getting your your COVID shot. Uh, uh, there are a lot of other issues that just sort of are on the slow burner. And, and that's why I appreciated during the legislative process, certain individuals, uh, legislators, that would actually work diligently on the other issues. Uh, and if you talk about energy issues, uh, Carl Holmes, uh, who you've interviewed, uh, comes to mind. Carl was just always wanting everybody to understand it 
and actually try to get ahead of the curve. Uh, so, it, it, but it may be that 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 the, the very nature of water level declines as a long term issue. As a, it, it's not the sort of issue that unless we have a if we have a really significant drought, everybody worries about water. But as soon as it rains, they move on to other things. The Ogallala is one of those slow motion crises, if you will. Yeah. It doesn't really no, and, lend and, and, itself and, and, to yeah. political solution. And, and that gets to back to, to why the water plan was so important way back when we were discussing it. Uh, and the efforts of Carlin and uh, Hayden and Bennett uh, to, to get it to the forefront to actually initiate a planning procedure, a planning process, uh, because it, it forces you on an annual basis now uh, to actually look at it. Now you can ignore it, but at least you get some planning. And, and that's how it, uh, it sort of ended. When I uh, got the chair of energy, well, we, were, so we need a state water plan, we need a state water plan. Uh, and uh, we're pushing for it. And I think my last, Year there, which was actually my second year uh, before I became Speaker of Tam, uh, the we passed a bill that basically put the water office in charge of doing the plan rather than the Water Resources Board. And in that act, we required that biannually they submit a report to the legislature. And we also had an extensive list of everything that was supposed to be put into the plan. And it was just uh, as I got off the committee in 85, I think in February, it was very quick. The one sentence water plan was passed, which basically was that this will be done annually. And uh, rather than just basically an, an, a huge enactment of the legislature, uh, the water plan would be looked at at an annual basis and uh, to see what, what was presented. And the idea that it would be a continuous process rather than, okay, we just did it, it goes on the shelf, or we forget about it. And then you get into the question of how often they look at it. But one of the key things is if you put a plan out, it would have had a whole bunch of stuff in it and a legislator could find fault with this part or a different legislator with that part. And so you try to get a critical mass to pass it, it wouldn't happen. That was the reason when we updated our state constitution uh, in the early 70s, we put them out section at a time because the states that put out a whole brand new constitution during that era, they, they couldn't pass them because there were, enough people didn't like parks. So this way, when it came before the legislature, here's something. And then you also had to, to respond to it. Uh, I remember the minimum stream flows, that was a continuous thing, adding those. and. Um, uh, there were certain programs where the state would have to spend some money. Okay, then you're looking at that issue. How are you going to get the, the assistance? Uh, it's a continuing thing. And we can hold ourselves and how we, we aren't looking at it. But the process, I believe, was, was improved through the work of Carlin, Hayden, because that, 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 those were issues that, that they worked on together. And particularly when you get into funding it, the uh, funding of the state water plan itself uh, was a laborious process. And everybody remembers Gus Bogina coming in at the last minute to cast the 21st vote. But there was a lot of woodshedding going on behind doors trying to, to get the funding for the state water plan. Uh, the state water plan, oh, it's a great plan. I really loved it. But the other guy had to pay for it. And that's always been the problem. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, another thing at the KCC I got involved in that actually dealt with water quality uh, in 96 was uh, unplugged wells, orphan wells. There was no, uh, no magic source to plug them. And so we spent that session too coming up with the Well Plugging Act, uh, which I think they were going to review again this, this session. I'm not sure the reasons, but... but we found a way to put in, I think about 1.6 million back then, but it was a share of uh, the oil industry paying part, the state putting in some general fund money. And ironically, uh, we, the state's uh, mineral royalties that we get from the federal government was also put into that as a part of it. 
And I, I never knew where those mineral royalties came from. There was a big chunk from Western Kansas. And when I looked at, well, here's Finney County. And I said, we don't have any federal land there. But I remember doing abstracts. Uh, we were in Southern parts of the county. The, the federal government gave the land to farmers as long as they planted trees, because back then there was a, a theory that if you planted trees, you would have more rain. Uh, and apparently on those leases, the federal government had retained the mineral interest so that when oil and gas was developed, Kansas got those royalties. Well, and they were dedicated by law of uh, Congress that they should be spent on, on areas related to uh, like oil and gas problems. So we got that money. And so we, we were able to put something together to start the process of protecting groundwater. Uh, I mean, at the KCC, they'd get a call from someplace down in Southeast Kansas. Well, they're making a parking lot for a new Walmart someplace, and they just found a whole bunch of unplugged wells. Uh, so the conservation division, what they did was important. You mentioned minimum stream flow. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the Ark River, because the Ark River goes right through the heart of Garden City, uh, southwestern Kansas. Uh, at what point do people start to become cognizant of lack of stream flow in the river and how much do they care? Well, the, you notice it if the river isn't flowing. Uh, I was in high school, uh, graduated in 63, but it was a common event. Uh, free two beer was available back in those days. Uh, there would be a keg party at the gate. Well, where's the gate? Well, the gate's located uh, down in the sand hills by the Arkansas River that actually flowed. Uh, well, it wasn't 100% of the time, but it was most of the time. Uh, I've actually got a picture a friend of mine gave me uh, taken from the top of the Windsor Hotel looking south, and you see the Arkansas River flowing. Another irony, you don't see any trees around it. They all came later. And that's uh, a free of fight, uh, if I say that word right, uh, issue that was part of our Ark River suit. So anyway, uh, talking about the Arkansas River, uh, when I was there originally in 58, 59, uh, the river was there, 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 there was stream flow, trees all around it. And that slowly went away. And uh, we've had over 10 years uh, go by where there was no flow at all at uh, the Garden City uh, period. Uh, and that's also when uh, the ditch companies uh, in particular, became interested in the fact that Colorado was not releasing water like they should. And so the hot button there came to me when they knock on my office door and wanted to know what the state could do so that the Colorado would start sending the amount that they should. Um, and as you well know the history, I think back in about 19... Seven and then later in 1943, there were two federal cases because the states have to sue each other in the U.S. Supreme Court. That's their only venue. And at the conclusion of the 43 suit, uh, I believe it was about 1948, the Kansas, Colorado, Arkansas River Compact was put together to more or less try and regulate how how much each state state gets. Um, and that works well so long as uh, you got water. Apparently, uh, the, they built a dam or something at Trinidad uh, that had something to do with how much water went into the John Martin Reservoir, uh, which was the key reservoir as far as them uh, dealing with it. But uh, I remember I had Carl Bentrup, Ed De Kaiser, they were uh, on the Ark River Commission as the representatives from Kansas, mm -hmm. and they kept complaining about how they weren't getting their fair share. They'd say uh, in Colorado, they'd show up at a meeting and Colorado had about a half dozen lawyers there and uh, Kansas would be lucky to have one. Colorado uh, is a notorious state as far as, have, as water law. They have water courts. They have law firms that specialize in it. Uh, they were also allegedly notorious for moving water around on paper uh, to put it places where some people felt it wouldn't. Anyway, um, that's what started my interest in, in getting the state involved in, in the Arkansas River lawsuit with Colorado. Uh, and we got the, while well, the first shot at funding didn't go through, 
uh, I think the next year we started getting some funding into the attorney general's office so that we could finally see about initiating the suit. And finally, we got the suit going and uh, uh, hired a great lawyer. Uh, I think New Mexico is where it had been uh, involved in the process. And by this time, I was now speaker pro tem, not on the energy committee. Uh, but when the budget was presented to our Ways and Means Committee, there was the request for 750,000 to continue the lawsuit. Governor Carlin didn't put the money in, which sort of surprised and shocked me. And so I probably felt like Charlie Angel, he was, I think, influential because he was vice president of the Senate. I was fortunate enough to be the speaker pro tem. So I immediately set about getting that money back in. And uh, we proceeded to set up a, a big meeting in the old Supreme Court chamber with the leadership of both houses, with the, the Attorney General's office, with uh, uh, Dave Pope and, and all of the key players. We even had our attorney come in to make the case that this was a very important lawsuit that we needed to proceed with. And if you were thinking about not doing it because there were some ditch companies out there concerned about some water rights, this is one thing else. The one thing the Attorney General Stephan, who was very supportive of this, made clear is Kansas has basically no strong water law background uh, in the process of, of, of our water law. Uh, and we needed to develop those skills. Uh, he also indicated, you know, this, this is a lawsuit that's gonna last a long time. But water is coming to be in more and more states an issue, particularly as it affects other states. And he was predicting, which did happen with the Nebraska lawsuit later, that we are going to have more problems with other states in how we deal with the legal issue of what each state is entitled to. Uh, and I had a very conservative uh, Ways and Means Committee to deal with. Uh, and in the process, I went down and I spoke to Governor Carlin and, and uh, at the conclusion of it, uh, he agreed that if I could get the money in, he wouldn't veto it. Uh, he, he was seeing that there was a good reason why we needed to continue that lawsuit. Uh, so that process continued. And then uh, another interesting thing happened, uh, since I'm in Garden City, people seem to knock on my door, but I, for a couple of years, this real estate agent or in from Colorado would knock on my door and he would ask uh, if I could find out if Kansas would be interested in purchasing water rights from Colorado farmers. And that idea really intrigued me because uh, if you had a right like that, it would be in perpetuity and it would obviously be something that would be beyond what the state would have been entitled to. Uh, and in visiting uh, with uh, well, Dave Pope and others, uh, we needed to have an idea of whether that uh, could be successful or not. So I was able to slip in an appropriation for about $25,000 uh, that session. And we had it studied by some legal experts. And their conclusion was, uh, well, as they weren't a court, that uh, you would end up with protracted litigation with Colorado, obviously. But at the end of the day, there was a strong likelihood that legally, uh, under the U.S. Constitution, the state of Kansas could own water rights from Colorado. We never did proceed with that. Uh, one of the reasons it was being offered back then is that the, the farmers along the ditches in, in Colorado were up in years. We had, we had had bad economic times, and this was one valuable resource. But we didn't pursue it because you wouldn't would not want to mix this up in the lawsuit. Uh, Colorado would have been an expert at just uh, uh, taking this as some tangent, tangential issue. So it, it never did really come to fruition. And uh, I remember uh, on a separate field conference uh, visiting with Greg's uh, attorney for the board back then. And uh, he had no knowledge that this study had been done, which we kept confidential. And so I gave him my only copy of it. I wish I'd kept a copy. But uh, visiting with him later, I asked, uh, did, was that of any value? And he says, yeah, there was a lot of stuff in there that helped him in his litigation with, with uh, the state of Nebraska. So I'm so running this long story here, but uh, the Arkansas River 
uh, is very important. And the folks did notice that it was disappearing. At least but the motivation, the initial motivation that, that brought it to people's attention was really the ditch companies that weren't getting their fair share for ditch irrigation, as opposed to say, the environmental community or just uh, people who noticed that there was no longer water in the river. But, well, as far as my perspective and who was knocking on my door, I'm sure the environmental people, as far as the environmental people, uh, I still got to see if there's a picture any place, but Bob Steffen came out one uh, summer and we had a canoe and we were canoeing in the Arkansas River down by the bridge, except there was no water in the river. <laughs> Does it, does it bother you to go out there and still see, you know, there's been the lawsuit and yet the vast stretches of the river between Garden and basically between those ditch diversions and say Great Bend uh, remain dry. And when I go out and talk about that issue, people sometimes back here in Eastern Kansas express surprise because they thought that that lawsuit solved that problem. Well, it, it yeah, did. well, it's, it's, uh, that lawsuit didn't solve the problem because it there never would have been a much, that much water coming through, I think, to have continuous stream flow because the alluvial right next to the river. I mean, as long as you're doing pumping and irrigating out there, that that also causes the problem. Uh, actually, I remember canoeing for real in that river once with my daughter uh, many, many years ago when we actually had some stream flow and it was a, a I wish it was happening all the time. And later when they had a sufficient flow uh, up at Syracuse, they'd have their, their tank races or bathtub races, whatever they were. Well, yeah, I, of course, but that's the whole problem. It's, uh, you know, you go up to North Lake Scott is the closest one, uh, but now they do have the Horse Chief Canyon uh, uh, Reservoir, which is, is a great place. But uh, it's not like where I live here in Topeka, where minutes I'm in a, a big reservoir. Right. And they got run on it. Uh, yeah, that, that basically that that river can, it, 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 in, in order to have sustained stream flow, you would have had buy out water rights either in Colorado or Kansas and basically in order to allow stream flow. And today that proposition would be so expensive that you don't ever really hear anybody yeah. talk yeah. about it. Hey, Dave, I've got a question that I think you're in a position to answer, maybe better than almost anybody else. What is it about southwestern Kansas that people in eastern Kansas understand the least? You, uh, you understand my question? What, I mean, that's a very different part of the world. I've spent some time out there. Most of the people I talk to in eastern Kansas they might have driven through Garden City a few times on the way to Colorado, but they don't know the place at all. What, what are their misconceptions about that part of the world? Why don't they understand that you wish they did? Maybe because you've got a lot of great people there. I, I still consider myself a Garden City and it's been 25 years since I've lived there. Uh, uh, it's, it is unique. I, I, I would, uh, and I'm gonna point this out in a different way. Uh, the Garden City community has always been a community of great diversity, but it's also welcomed more diversity. Uh, the Ford Foundation did a study out there. Uh, dur during the Vietnam War, we had two waves of, of refugees coming from Southeast Asia. Uh, one was uh, more or less the poorer ones. Uh, another one, uh, they, were, they were better off, but, uh, and prior to that, we had had uh, Hispanics that had settled out, uh, particularly when we had sugar beets. I mean, the, the Garden City High School's newspaper is called the Sugar Beet. And I don't think the kids today would know where it got that name because 50 years ago there, or more, there used to be a sugar beet there. Uh, and there used to be migrant workers coming through that hard worked in those sugar beet fields. Uh, we had uh, all sorts of labor issues at certain times uh, there. Then we had the packing plants. Of course, they need workers. Uh, the, uh, there's a huge trailer park right on the east side of Garden City. 
they're basically because Holcomb was very effective in keeping development out because of the IBP plant that was close by. But I, I think the story I'm making here, uh, we, the Hispanics settled out earlier and later on they, they became the leaders of the town. Uh, one of them once was saying that there was this outside organizer in his office saying, well, we want to get you guys. And he, he looked at him and said, why would you want to do that? We're already on the school board. We're here. You know, all you want to do is make money for yourself. So they kicked him out. Uh, then we had the wave of the Southeast Asians. And the study showed that there really wasn't any, you know, Anglo animosity going on. More of it was it had to do with uh, the competition between jobs with the Hispanics and those. And since then, we've had uh, a group of Muslims. In fact, uh, you recall the incident where these uh, white supremacists were going to bomb uh, a bunch of these Muslims. Uh, they lived basically uh, about five blocks from where I lived in Garden City. And there's a, a tennis court there that uh, I was driving by and visiting a couple of years ago. There were about 100 people there, uh, and they were actually Muslims doing religious practices there. But the community itself has always tried to work with them. There are certain leaders in the community. When they come in, the city manager uh, would oftentimes have monthly meetings with them. Uh, the mayor would. Uh, they, they tried to work to assimilate to help people. Uh, and it's just uh, Strangers in Town is, is a, was a video that was done right. a couple of years ago that I think speaks strong words that at least the Garden City community, it, it was an inclusive community. You're a friend. Um, you, you're always going to have a few of those who, uh, the white supremacist type. But Garden City has always been to me an example of how to do it different. Uh, the schools, when, when we had the huge numbers of kids come in with, with the beef plant, uh, we had to have new schools. And the business community in Garden City always supported those bond issues. And I talked to several of them and I said, well, of course, you know, we have done well because of that business coming in, but we also have a responsibility to make sure that we give back or take care of them, to make them a part of our community. Uh, I, I guess maybe if there's any answer, uh, I, the vast majority of us feel that we're part of a human community that we really want to experience with others. It's a, an incredibly diverse place. And I'm not sure that people in Eastern Kansas sometimes appreciate just how diverse it is. Uh, and that might not seem to connect to why we're having this conversation. Yeah. But if it weren't for that water, those packing plants wouldn't be there. But if it weren't for the water, the corn wouldn't be being grown. If it weren't for the corn, the, the, the feedlots wouldn't be there. If it weren't for the feedlots, the packing plants weren't there, and the packing plants are one of the big reasons for that diversity. Uh, you put all that together, it really all comes back to, to water. What, what do you think the future is for that area, which you're right, and certainly the Ogallala is inequitably distributed. There's more under southwestern Kansas than other parts of the state. Nonetheless, it is a finite resource. There's no question that in parts of southwestern Kansas you're seeing declines. What, what's the future for that part of the world? The future is going to be how they continue to develop management tools for dealing with a depleting aquifer until they can attain what could be called sustainability, however you want to define it. Uh, I, it's not going to disappear overnight like you turn the lights off. Uh, people will have time to do some adjustments. Now, the question will be how they might want to control or set up a way of controlling the water usage to help with that. That will be a big political problem. Uh, as far as how they, what water is there to use, you're always going to have that water there for the priority use of people. But then where, where do you go next? Livestock, again, the feedlot operations will probably be next on the list. Irrigation, because it uses so much water, is probably going to be the area where uh, the lack of water is going to have to be dealt with in, in different ways. I've seen cornfields in southwest Kansas that are non-irrigated. 
I would never have believed uh, 60 years ago I could see anything like that because uh, Southwest Kansas is made with irrigation and corn and the grains. And so it's cheaper to have the feedlots right next to the corn. And that's why it's, if you got a feedlot, it's a lot cheaper to have the packing plant next to the feedlot, which is why it all developed. And then of course you have your ancillary stuff. I do not see it uh, disappearing just quickly, but I think they will have opportunities to try and handle a depletion till they can come up to what the community out there feels is sustainable. Uh, those, that might be a good place to stop, Dave. I, I think those challenges are, uh, are huge and difficult, uh, but you know, we, you talk about voluntary reductions up in northwestern Kansas with the Limas, the local enhanced management areas. There was recently one of those in Wichita County, which is not in southwestern Kansas, but it's getting an awful lot closer. Uh, that day may come, it seems like. It, it's going to come one way or another. You're either going to yeah. band together and voluntarily reduce, or you're going to run out of water to supply really large scale ir irrigation. You're going to get the same. To, to a similar place one way or another. Yeah. It's just a question of how you get there. Yeah, and, and some folks have ideas. Uh, it's just the timing of those ideas and, and how they could be implemented. Uh, uh, you know, how bad is a crisis? You can do more extreme things during a crisis if it's act, actually perceived as a crisis than if you're not seeing any problems. I mean, it's just human nature, yeah. unfortunately or unfortunately. Well, I appreciate that you're, you're willing to, to talk about this, Dave, because you've had a, a long history from a part of the world where water, whether everybody's cognizant of it, an awful lot of what goes on out there is the result of water. I, you know, I was just out there last week measuring water levels and you know, there's this new yogurt factory there in Garden City. There's a new water park. It's hard not to look around there and not see all the now, things our going old, on. World's, world's largest free municipal concrete swimming pool where I swam at as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And actually, historically, before they built that pool there, it used to be located where there was a cattle dipping pond. Really? In wow. the you, you do go back a long ways, Dave, farther than I thought. <laughs> I wasn't that <thinking> <laughs> Well, I appreciate the conversation. I, oh, uh, I think always. you bring a perspective that's uh, really valuable. So I think it's uh, good to visit. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rex.